um, this guy was uh, one of our members and also part of our family. He was like so sweet and calm, polite. My name is Sharon Munyan and I'm, uh, I used to live in Durban, now I've moved to, to Johannesburg. My dad was a pastor and he ran, he ran his own church in, in Durban in the area called Phoenix. I've come from a very calm, polite home as my dad was a minister. We were not exposed to, to violence or arguments between my parents. I met my ex-husband in church. Um, this guy was uh, one of our members and also part of our family. He was like so sweet and calm, polite. In the beginning, my dad thought he was the best person because he was so church orientated. My father thought he was a perfect match. He would be, he would be that one person that would look after me. He approached my dad and he wanted my dad's approval to date me, basically. Things were going so fast, my dad got me married. I didn't know much of his background, just his family. Personally, I didn't know him at all, you could say. Only what he showed me, I knew. On the night I got married, uh, my family was quite okay, they were happy. But on his side, his mom was like, uh, you know, she's not the best thing you could have got. His mom could not let him go. And on that wedding day, she became very emotional. And uh, I think that put him into a depression mode or something of that nature and it was like as if he was getting torn from his family. So as the afternoon went on, he decided to go out with his friends. He said it was his last night of bachelor's night and it was difficult for me to understand because a week before that he went out with his friends saying this is my bachelor's night. But I was going through a lot of emotions at that time. My head was like every other young person at the age of 24 will want like this romantic night, this this night where you know you would not forget. It's a once off for a lady. But for me, unfortunately, it was not like that. The next morning that he came back with maybe three love bites, and he said, you know, I, I, I needed to tell my ex goodbye. And um, yeah, that was the first time I got the slap. And I kept it quiet because, you, you know, when you're in, in a family home, you can't say much because all your families get involved in the problems. So that night passed by, and he promised it will be his last, He'll never do it again. It was just a once-off thing. I think the saddest part of the day was, uh, you know, everyone looks forward to asking you, hey, how was your night? How do you tell the people, yeah, I was slept last night? But three months later, he lost his job, he came home uh, drunk and because my dad was a pastor, he pretended to be like possessed or something. He was like another force took over him and he walked in drunk. So my dad uh, looked at me and my dad asked me, what is this? So I asked him, I said, uh, you are not working now. How do how, how you manage to drink? At that time I was a lamb, so I was spoke in a very soft tone. So I asked him, so why are you drunk? Uh, and then he just got into a rage, like, mind your own business. Don't ask me what, what am I doing. Uh, I've been with my friends, but my friends are more important than you. And I don't need to live here. I can go back to my mother's house. And as the argument rose between more between my mother and him, not so much my dad, not even me. So out of the blues, he just, he just decided to just hit me across them. It was like he had no respect for them at the present time. Besides the slap, I even got hurt falling. And when I woke up again, and then he hit me again. <laughs> you know, when you're pregnant, you, you, you want this love, this, this care in somebody, and, and you don't have it, it's more depressing than anything else. So that was a sad second episode. 
But when he returned, he came back again with all promises to my dad, speaking about, I'll go through counseling, I promise to do this, I promise to stop drinking. It was, um, it was the 25th of January. It was a very rainy afternoon that afternoon. So during the day, my dad, uh, he bought Kentucky and he bought a lot of fruits and he came home. And uh, we had a late lunch. Uh, that afternoon, my dad gave me some cash. He gave me cash for the child uh, to buy the first set of clothes to go to the hospital. And uh, he came in the afternoon. I was in the room already. And as he was speaking and he wanted the cash, he wanted that money that my dad gave me. It was about, maybe about 300 rand. And uh, he wanted 100 rand from there. And when I refused to give the 100 rand for him, he started to nag, calling me all funny words. And then he kept on demanding the 100 rand. As I kept on saying no, he became more angry, more frustrated, more tempered. And eventually, he took my purse. When he took my purse, he kept on pulling me around and pushing me, you know? Uh, like a one arm holding the purse and he's kept, on, he's kept on pulling my hand, pulling the purse. First he started pushing me, you know, like pushing me against the wardrobe. He kept on pushing me and pushing me. Eventually he slapped me. When he slapped me, I think that's the time he, he, he just continued slapping me till because I wasn't letting go of my, of, my, of my wallet. I wasn't letting go of it. And then I needed that cash. I needed it so badly for the child. But for him, it's like I was holding something that belonged to him. Eventually, he started punching me. And the first punch he gave me was to my head. And then he started punching me all over. He like just went wild and, and according to him, he said he, he lost control because he was trying to hit me on my face. He was said, I want to disfigure you today. I want, to, I want you to look as ugly as ever. And when every time I blocked my face, that's how my stomach got hurt. That's how my head got hurt. And just for 100 rand, that's how violent he became, for 100 rand. He lost himself because he needed the money for alcohol. When we moved there, he felt now, ha, and now you're in my territory. When you were in your mother's house, I was restricted. Now I have my own freedom here. If you're enjoying this episode, please tap that like button and consider subscribing. So that 10 minutes was the most crucial time, I think that tore me from within. And emotionally, it emotionally it took me, it took me by storm. Because after the incident, about an hour later, I blacked out. He eventually got the money. He got more than he wanted. He took about 200 rand after hitting me and he left. When I reached the clinic, they asked me, did you catch a hiding? And I said, no, I fell. I think at that time, and I think I was more afraid because I was already in the ministry. What do I tell people? I was, I was just like swallowing all of this, just keeping it within myself. So society won't have that outlook of you. Coming back from the hospital um, and uh, for him, forgive and forget was the key to everything. And then my dear dad gave me this talk and uh, he said, you know what? Don't walk away because every man has a chance to change and everybody do have the opportunity to change. Give him just another chance to change. At that time, my dad was my life. Anything he said, I would listen. I was not ready to back talk my dad because it was my dad's choice. I listened to my dad. That's what I did. On the early hours of the 28th, I went into labor. I was with my dad, alone, with my family. When the baby was born, she was so beautiful. And I said to myself, you know, all these things that I've been through in this, in this few, in this list, in this year, 
it was worth it for the child. That moment of having this child in your hand. For the seconds that you forgot all the hiding that you've collected two days before this. I forgot all the, the hardship, the, the worst that I've been through in that nine months of pregnancy. Everything has just faded in that moment of having this, this girl in my hand. She was like a ray of hope for me. And when I was discharged and I came home, he didn't drink for about two weeks after that. It was like everything was so nice. Now this child was here, life was changing. Uh, he started a part-time job. So when he started the part-time job, and the child was about three months by then, I was still living with my dad. He insisted we must move back into his parents' home. Uh, we moved to his father's home, which was two roads away from my dad. When I moved there, it was like, um, it's like you're walking from heaven into hell. When we moved there, he felt now, and now you're in my territory. When you were in your mother's house, I was restricted. Now I have my own freedom here. When he, uh, when he started a part-time job, gee, in that part-time job, every Friday would get paid. But unfortunately, that pay was not for us. It was for him and his pleasures. After he did whatever he had to do with the money, then the balance of the money he would bring home. And in that balance, you had to take care of the entire family that is there, plus yourself, plus the child. So my parents was basically looking after my child. Whatever was needed to be bought, they would buy it for them, for my, for my baby. And I had to work, I had to pay the rent where I was in his home, buy the food. His mom would always stand before him. Whenever there's an issue, she never allowed him to grow up. She'd always stand there. He, it was like she was, he was her pet. And she'd always say, no, give him a chance, give him a break. And even when he would hit me in front of them, it was okay with them because they'll just walk away. It's like they, they're not seeing what is happening. And she'll say, you know, um, you know what? He, he'll get sobered up tomorrow. He'll, he'll, he'll forget everything tomorrow. Well, unfortunately, that tomorrow's became years. So that afternoon, it was a, a Sunday afternoon. I left my daughter with my mom, and I came back home. Um, the next day, I had to go to work on a Monday. But that night, I decided that this was going to be enough is enough. I took about 180 pressure tablets. I took metformin, about 200. And I just drank everything, and I said, if I sleep, I must not awake, <coughs> because it, I couldn't handle this. I must have slept about five hours into the overdose, or six hours. And in the morning, I was just like throwing up and throwing up and throwing up. Um, my father-in-law, who worked at the clinic at that time, uh, phoned the ambulance, and I was rushed to the hospital. When I was rushed at the hospital, I, I remember the doctor said, you know, with all these medication that you have taken, you were supposed to be like dead long time ago, back, about three hours ago. I can't understand how you're alive. But when I woke and I woke up in a hospital bed, uh, I had machines on me, I had um, trips, and I was just like, oh my God, I'm still alive. I remembered he came to the hospital and um, with no sympathy. He said, you're embarrassing me for taking this overdose because my father works here. You're embarrassing our family. But my father-in-law on the other side was very sympathetic. I remember that morning he said, you can just leave him. Why do you have to die? And when I finally got discharged, I was taken back straight to my dad's home. After three weeks, I found out that I was three months pregnant. And I said to myself, oh my God, again, now I'm gonna bring forth this child. I don't know if this child is gonna be damaged. I don't know if this child is gonna be normal. I only knew one thing, that I didn't support abortion at that time. So I couldn't drop this baby. I had to have this baby. 
So I named my son, I named him Joel Fabian. And the reason I gave him these two names is because of the overdose that I've taken and the very fact that he came out alive. But when Joel was three, month, three weeks old, I went back to work because I had to take care of the entire finances on my own. The children started to grow. Eventually my daughter was in school. My son was witnessing basically all the abuse that I was going through because my son wasn't detaching from me very well like my daughter. It came a time one day uh, that I said, today we're gonna get paid, it's a Thursday, right? Next day was Good Friday. And I said, today I'm not gonna leave my bank card at home because of my children. Today I'm gonna take my bank card, I'm gonna draw my own money out. And I'm gonna spoil these kids because everybody was getting spoiled at that time. Everyone's family was having good Easter's and good Christmases, but not us. I decided to ask my dad to bring my two children to the Phoenix Plaza at that time. And I said, today I'm gonna take these children, make them feel like, you know, like joy and, and love like every other child. So I took those two children on a nice shopping spree that day and um, gave my son the trolley to push. He was excited and running around like with so much of it was so, it was so lovely. I said, Dad, uh, from today, I don't mind if I'm not a preacher. I don't mind it. I want to become a teacher. If you're enjoying this episode, hit that like button and please consider subscribing. Unfortunately, we had to come back home in the afternoon and we had so much of stuff with us. You know, 19, say 17 years ago, 1,000 rand was a lot of money to buy groceries with. So we bought a lot of things. And then, is this the money, this the time? So I said, no, I took the children out. You know, we went, went to, to enjoy ourselves. I remember he grabbed me through the gate first. The children immediately started to scream and tantrum. And then he pulled me through, from through the gate, he hit me through the gate. Then he opened the gate and he brought me inside. He said, firstly, you had no right to take your car this morning. That was firstly. Secondly, who gave you a right to take these kids without me? I remembered he hit me on the back of my head. I blacked out completely. When I went to the doctor on that Tuesday because I needed a sick note for work, because I could not pick my head up, just to find out that the four nerves on the back of my head here was damaged. On the last incident, uh, the kids were quite grown up by now. My daughter was 16, my son was 14. We were already into the 16th year of our marriage. I, um, it was 2012. That year, because of all the community work that I was doing, I was nominated to be the Woman of the Year for, for the Phoenix in the North Coast region. When I went for this function, I felt so excited that, you know, at least something good came out of all of this. But he attended that function after all, he came. And when I was nominated for the Woman of the Year and the sashes and the crowns were put on, you know, it was like, it was like something good happened. It took, it, it, it did something to me on the inside. It stirred something in me on the inside. Because I was already doing the community work. I was already doing upliftment programs. I threw myself into the community. I said to myself, if I can't better my life, at least allow, I want to allow myself to better somebody else's life with my experiences. On the 17th of September in 2012 was the last day that I allowed someone to degrade me and put me down. It was the last day that I was gonna take another slap, another word, another abuse. And when he left, I remember my last words to him was that, see, when you walk, through, when you walk out of these doors, you're never ever gonna return. And ever since he had walked out, he tried in that first five months he tried everything that he had done in the, in the 16 years of promises. I never allowed him to come back into our lives. I didn't believe in love when I left him because for me, love was a fake emotion of bluffing your heart, you're happy, but you're not really happy. And I said to my dad, I said, Dad, 
uh, from today I don't mind if I'm not a preacher because if I get divorced I can't preach I don't mind it I want to become a teacher I want to teach I want to go into the world I want to go into the communities and I want to teach women that was suppressed like me was abused like me that was bottling it up like me I want to teach them how to come out and how to live I remembered uh, I remember my father said I will support you I remember my father saying I've seen too much of your ID now for the first time in 16 years my father gave me his full support eventually I opened up an organization with this empowerment of women I was so hardcore to that if, if although I didn't open myself others to change me but I was sure going to open up others to change them and I've ran many many programs the most exciting thing was last year is uh, when we opened up an organization called the One Woman Pat. The Pat is producing active communities together. That was an excitement because that's when we really started to launch domestic violence on another level. Taking women, encouraging them, motivating them and changing them. And for me that was the stepping stone to success. Yes, I will not ever stop pushing myself to do more and to be more. My children grew up, my daughter became a mom. My son, he he's now the voice of youth speaking out for the boy child. What do boys do when they watch their moms catch hiding? How do they react? What what is the emotion of a son? For me, I've written a poem last year that was published in the 25 years of democracy. And I entitled the poem on breathe because in my darkest moments when my back was against the wall, I had no one that I could turn to. Because I was already in the social life, I was already pe having people look up to me for advice. And I couldn't go to anyone else for advice. So I wrote this poem called Breathe. It's when your back is against the wall. All you can ever do is just breathe and believe. Breathe and believe in yourself. I must have not been the most prettiest woman that he had ever seen. But I felt like the most beautiful woman that I have ever been. I allowed myself to come out. I allowed myself to shine. Yes, financially I was down, but that didn't matter to me. I was going to build myself up. I'm going to push myself to such a stage that, you know, he must look back and think, did I really do that to that person? So it's, when you come out of that, you must not go back. You must go forward. That's my encouragement.